Thinking about economics isn't so hard. Most people do it every day. Most work and spending decisions are actually economic decisions. Yet it isn't these sorts of decisions that cause people to fear economics as a subject. After all, most people know how to shop. The economic questions that baffle people are the big ones over which the individual has almost no control. Why are my credit card interest rates so high? Why is gasoline so expensive? Can anyone explain the incredible cost of medicine? Why can't anyone just work their way through college anymore? And who got to decide that the town's best factory should be moved to Malaysia? The shrinking American middle class has a right to be confused and frightened by the big economic issues. Their way of life is under attack. The numbers explain their worries. In 1970, a person could attend a typical state university for $1,500 a year. Any job within walking distance of campus paid $2 per hour. Work 25 hours a week during school and 40 in the summer and the school bills could be paid. Now school costs at least $12,000 a year. Campus jobs pay more, but rarely as much as $7 an hour. So a student working just as diligently as someone 35 years earlier cannot pay the fees and must instead incur huge amounts of debt. In 1970, a three-bedroom suburban-style house cost $20,000. Mortgage rates were 5%. House payments averaged less than 25% of an average income. Down payments were rarely more than $1,000. Now such a house costs at least $200,000. House payments eat up at least 40% of a two-income household. And don't even think about getting sick. In 1970, the average hospital stay was six days and cost $1,200. Now the average stay is three days at a whopping cost of $18,000. Since 1970, real average wages have climbed by 150%. Medical costs are up 1,500%. Of course... Some things have become cheaper since 1970. Exhibit A is any electronic device. But while computers and iPods and digital cameras are really fine things to have, they are but economic trinkets compared to the major expenses that define who you can become, how you are sheltered from the elements, and whether you have care when sick. All the average guy really knows about the big economic questions is that it used to be easier to prosper. Of course, such an observation is incredibly important. If a person knows that it was once easier to get on with life, that person implicitly understands that not so long ago the economy was better organized and that somehow what was once working is not working any longer. Any serious discussion of economics must explain why this simple observation is so profoundly correct. But in addition to answering the questions of how the USA got so rich and what went wrong, Economics must answer the far more interesting question of whether it will be possible for the old prosperity to return. The history of American prosperity contains four essential stories. 1. Sowing the Seeds of Industrial Greatness the contributors to the various forms of American progressive thought include the inventors, the revolutionaries, the progressive industrialists, the homegrown intellectuals, the trade unionists, 
and the populace. 2. The Greatest Generation Economics Division The organizing principles of the New Deal included public industrial cooperation and an expansionist monetary policy. Economic thinkers of the era developed the mixed economy which produced the greatest generalized prosperity in history. We live in a world created by people who believed that markets did not work well unless carefully regulated. They were correct. Unregulated market capitalism is a never-ending litany of destruction, failure, and chaos. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. Three, the great decline, the triumph of pre-industrial economics. It is time to examine the dangers of operating an industrial infrastructure with a minimum maintenance strategy and examine the human cost and ruined potential that is the inevitable outcome of the free market economics of decline. Take, for example, nuclear power. Only an economic organization of state subsidies, government-funded academic research, and cost-plus defense contracts would have produced something so difficult and complicated. Yet now we are supposed to believe that the same free market economic system that gave us Enron will now be able to decommission old nukes, provide for 50,000 year storage of highly toxic waste, and figure out a better way to power our nation. Four, the potential tomorrow. The possible future if we return to the economic organizing principles of the greatest generation. The American middle class is profoundly frightened for their economic futures. With good reason. Their living standards are under assault from forces seemingly beyond their understanding. Without a fundamental change of economic direction, they have no future. Creating prosperity is the known economic strategy for addressing real human problems. Learning these ideas can reassure the middle class that those large economic forces that so frighten them are both understandable and within their power to change and control. Climate change the end of the age of petroleum, etc., are problems that will only get worse if not promptly addressed. And there is always a need for more good jobs. If the current economic thinking cannot provide a method to solve unemployment while also solving these critical problems, and it is clear it cannot, then the time has come for citizens to demand something that works better. And only a technologically literate economic system will be able to do this. And history has demonstrated that absolutely nothing works better than a mixed economy where the behavior of the largest players is strictly regulated. Creating prosperity is a message of hope. It is a call to action. Best of all, it is a plan that requires us to merely show as much initiative, organization, and imagination that our grandparents demonstrated while building this once great nation.